Please welcome back Saul Osterlitz. And please welcome uh, cinematographer Joan Churchill. Uh, producer Porter Bibb. Editor Mira Bank. And Judy Mazels. Porter, I wanted to start with you. Uh, you had spent some time working with Albert and David Mazels. I was hoping you could tell us a bit about how this project first came about, the idea of making a film about the Rolling Stones, and then how it ended up changing over the course of the production. Not too many people know this outside of the team that was at Maisel's Films, but we spent six months in the middle of 1969 preparing to shoot Woodstock. And two days before Woodstock actually happened, we had a deal with Warner Brothers and they were gonna put the money up. And we, were, we had shot months of uh, preparations for the concert and we're really excited about what Woodstock was gonna turn out to be. And 48 hours before Woodstock opened, we had a meeting with Ted Ashley, who was then the president of Warner Brothers. And um, he said, we've got the money, we're, everything's all set, but you have to do one thing. I said, what's that? And he said, you gotta get a completion bond. That's an insurance policy that covers any contingency that might develop when you're making the film. And I said, well, you know you can't get a completion bond for a documentary because it's unpredictable. We don't know what's gonna happen. And he said, well, what happens if it rains? And I said, if it rains, you've got the greatest film of the year. <laughs> and he said, we can't, my lawyers are not gonna let us give you the money. Um, we had to go back to the Maisel's Films office and tell everybody that we were not shooting Woodstock and Mike Wadley took over, recruited most of the people who were lined up to shoot it for us. And uh, I went up to Woodstock and loaded film for Mike backstage. After that event, the Maisels and I sat down and I said, there's one band that didn't show up in Woodstock. We have to do something. And a couple of months later, that opportunity presented itself when the Stones announced they were gonna do a, an abbreviated US tour the latter part of November in 1969. While they were in Washington, Boston, New York, you saw some of the great concerts at Madison Square, concert footage at Madison Square Garden. I had this idea of creating a West Coast counter to Woodstock and I called up my friend Jan Winner, who was running Rolling Stone in its earliest incarnation out of San Francisco, and I said, Jan, we need to put a concert on featuring the Rolling Stones in San Francisco. Who do I talk to? And he said, well, there are many people already trying to do that, but they've all failed. And if you want to make something happen, I suggest you call a crazy lawyer, Melvin Belli. <laughs> Melvin Belli had just taken on Squeaky Frome, who had tried to assassinate Gerald Ford. And I called up Mr. Belli from New York and said, Mr. Belli, I have a new client for you. And he said, I don't need any new clients. I've got all the publicity I need. Squeaky Frome is my client. Who is yours, Mr. Bibb? I said, well, it's the Rolling Stones and the children of San Francisco. And he said, well, wh what's the issue here? What's the case? And I said, there's no case. We want you to help them have a Christmas and Hanukkah present for all of San Francisco with a free concert by the Rolling Stones. And that's basically how Altamont started. I also, by the way, I should say, uh, I will be in your office at nine o'clock the next morning, and I wanna see 50 Vestal Virgins with rose petals 
outside showering you as you agree to help us get this concert off the ground. <laughs> I don't know about the Vestal Virgins, but I also called every radio and television station and all the newspapers in San Francisco, and they showed up on Mr. Belli's doorstep when I did at 9 a.m. the next morning. Joan, you were one of the young cinematographers hired to uh, shoot the concert at Altamont. Can you tell us a bit about what it was like to arrive at the show the night before and what your experiences were like the day of the concert? Uh, yeah, so I was um, helicoptered in the night before to shoot You know the people who had come early and um, shoot around the campfires. And I was told that, you know, once I was finished shooting, I should go to security and tell them that I was with the Maisels and they'd let me in and somewhere I would find a place to sleep. Um, so I did my duty and shot people uh, sitting around the campfires and then got to security and they were like, Maisel, schmazels, nobody gets in here until eight o'clock in the morning. So I was up all night um, and got in with the crush of people uh, at eight and uh, was given uh, my next assignment, which was to go over to the other side, it was a huge area, and shoot uh, the cars coming up um, across the hills. And I was, you know, I hadn't slept, I hadn't eaten or had anything to drink, and people were passing out food and drink, which I took gratefully and got myself over to where I needed to set up and took my light meter out, and there were rainbows coming out of it. And I was like, oh no, I've been dosed. Um, I, you know, somebody had given me acid. Um, I had had acid uh, before and had decided that I never ever wanted to do it again. Um, so uh, I got myself back to the stage and crawled underneath the stage and sort of put my arms around the legs of somebody named Eric Saarinen who was shooting stage uh, right, I think. And, um, and spent eight hours crouched under there in horror. Um, every time I looked out, you know, the, the stage was you know, maybe as tall as this. I mean, they hadn't, they hadn't raised it enough. Um, everybody was pressing to get to the stage and that's where all the violence was and um, that's where the Hells Angels were. And uh, it was just, horrible um, experience. Um, and then after about eight hours, I was okay and I came back out, it was about four in the afternoon. Um, I was given my own Hells Angel to, uh, you know, look after me. I regarded him as my guardian angel. He was very nice to me and put at the back of the stage and you know, just stay out of trouble and I became transfixed by a man at the front of the stage who was writhing and you just saw the shot of this guy sort of going through exactly what I had just gone through and I could really relate to this guy and I was not interested in Mick Jagger who was prancing around in the foreground, out of focus. I was just zoned in on that guy. And um, it's, you know, it's a, a, a beautiful shot. And uh, Charlotte Swearing, who was one of the co-directors of the film, loved that shot. And uh, she got me hired on an American family shortly thereafter. So, you know, she, that shot made my career. Anyway, it was a, quite a trip. Judy, your husband, David Maisels, was one of the filmmakers tasked with figuring out what to do with all the footage that emerged from Altamont. Can you tell us a bit about what the struggle was like for him in terms of figuring out how to make a film out of this? Well, 
I don't think David had as much struggle about how to make the film because he had Charlotte and you know the two of them just worked so well together. I think his struggle was finances because there was a lien from Universal for ten or fifteen thousand dollars, and they were trying to screw us and make us bankrupt. And we were, you know, David was just, you know, hand to mouth. One of the j jokes was, "Can we afford to eat home tonight, honey?" No, um, we need the cash. Use the American Express. Um, if we go under, what's another dinner at the Russian Tea Room? Which was David's <laughs> attitude about things. And I think the other struggle was getting Mick to agree to finish the fi to make the film possible. And he flew to London. Um, he was coming for going for two days, and he was there for at least three weeks. And every day. Mick would say, oh, I'm probably going to sign tomorrow, and tomorrow would come, and he didn't sign. And if it wasn't for Donald Camel, I'm not sure if he ever would have. But you can understand seeing the film why Mick would be hesitant. So it was a real challenge for David to win. And Mira, you were one of the young editors hired to work with Charlotte Swearon and the other filmmakers. Can you give us a sense of what some of the challenges you and the other editors perceived were, were at hand in terms of making this into a coherent narrative? <laughs> well, films, first of all, it's interesting about uh, Woodstock and, and this film because indeed the um, three of us uh, who came on as assistants, Susan and Janet and I, had all worked on Woodstock. And as soon as the the gears shifted on that film, uh, the overlap was with this film, and we were recruited to, to come on and, and, uh, and work on, on Give Me Shelter. It was actually Janet, I think, who, who called me and got me to come on. And I had been living in London, and I think that was another reason that um, just before I had come to the States, um, right before Woodstock, I'd been living there. So. Uh, and I'd, I'd been at some of the free concerts in Hyde Park, and so I sort of, they sort of thought, well, when these tons of footage come in with, you know, different camera crews and so on, you know, these guys will know how to organize the material. Um, but this was during a time when, um, you know, uh, things weren't digital, and there was... Um, uh, indifferent uh, or sometimes inadvertent inability to slate and to do the kinds of things that make it possible to simply uh, put up a piece of footage and look at it in sync. <laughs> so there were weeks and weeks of um, that like kind of work. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of feet of film. Uh, hundreds of thousands. So What you saw up here <laughs> is the distillation of maybe a mile's worth of, of 16 millimeter film. Yeah. Unbelievably great editing job. Yeah, and it, it was also, you know, it was necessarily a team effort then, be, uh, partly because of these organizational issues. And something, for instance, like the sequence that Kent McKinney edited, um, Love in Vain, that very beautiful slow motion sequence, you couldn't simply take a piece of footage and look at it in slow motion. This was film. So everything had to be. Um, plotted, you know, in a, um, an analog way and then uh, tested, you know, with interim versions that were done in slow motion and so on. So it was making that kind of seamless thing happen on, on screen was very difficult. And the geniuses of this, Charlotte for sure, uh, Ellen Gifford, who is a great, great film editor. I did a lot of work with Ellen and uh, a lot of it on the later part with the uh, the Jefferson Airplane and a lot of what was going on in the crowd, the sort of thing that Joan had been filming, and figuring out what had happened when and which camera it was on and so on was extremely complicated. Um, and one of the, I think it comes up in your book, one of the enormous issues was finding out where the murder had happened and how it had happened. And with all of us spending weeks and weeks looking through footage and, and trying to find that material, somehow or other, I was the one who found it. And then when that happened, I really think, and we talked a little bit about this earlier, it was, it was Charlotte and David who were really playing three-dimensional chess and who understood that this really was the linchpin of how to tell the story. 
Well, I and remember, I remember Ev um, David saying every camera person said they had the killing, yeah. and the one person who said he didn't have it was the camera person that had yeah, it. Was <laughs> there, he had it, yeah. Anyway, you see the result on film, and we can talk more about this later if you want to, but that was really the, the lots of sequences were being worked on. Mel Belli was being worked on. Many things were being worked on in sort of in a discreet way within uh, the truth of that particular story, but something had to make it all come together. Uh, apart from, and people can say this was the death of the 60s, but this was the high renaissance of rock and roll. I mean, this is as good as it gets. And, um, so, but in spite of that, and certainly in spite of the, the horrors that happened there, there needed to be a way to sort of coalesce all of that and make it come together uh, creatively and, and philosophically. And, and that, that was what happened when we found that that was actually recorded on film. Yeah, and something that I, I believe you mentioned this to me, but some of the other, other editors did as well, was that the initial impression was that uh, the killing had taken place during Sympathy for the Devil, and everyone was positive that that was the case, and that it ended up taking weeks longer because of that mistaken first impression. Yeah, yeah. and you can see the number of times where there was a scuffle and the ground was cleared, and everybody thought, it must have happened here, it must have happened here. It was, it was not easy to sort of sort through everything and, and determine that. Porter, uh, you had mentioned to me before that there wound up being some unexpected opportunities that emerged as a result of having uh, filmed at Altamont and having captured the killing of Meredith Hunter. Uh, can you tell me, tell us a bit about the dispute that you ended up having with Albert and David over how best to handle that? Well, uh, among other things, when, once they uh, fit, it turned out uh, we had two, two different cameras on uh, Meredith Hunter uh, during that episode. And once the actual footage was uh, located, Life Magazine called us up and offered us $50,000 for one frame to put on the cover of Life Magazine. And as the producer, I, I immediately said, we have to do this. And, Albert and David said, no, we can't do it. It'll give away the whole story. And I said, David, Albert, everybody knows what happened at Altamont. <laughs> You're not giving away anything. But they turned down the $50,000, which was, in 1969 was quite a lot of money for a cover shot. And Mary, you had mentioned um, Charlotte Zwerin's involvement and, and her role in terms of kind of figuring out the puzzle of Gimme Shelter. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about how everyone came to the realization that there needed to be this extra footage or this return to the Rolling Stones to kind of get their response to what had taken place? I'm not sure exactly, but uh, I think partly it came about because we knew um, from the uh, amazing intensity and time of effort to even locate this footage, um, how difficult it was going to be for an audience to make sense of it. Um, and in, in the looking at it back and forth, and again, always trying to determine uh, what else was on camera, what else had been happening, uh, what, you know, what was the context of that taking place, um, it, I think it became apparent that there had to be a way to isolate that moment. and. Um, in a sense, to 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 make it the uh, the MacGuffin or the you know the, the centerpiece of what everybody was looking for in the story, um, and m my my recollection is that it was was Charlotte who understood that, and then and then David who really you know David was on the phone to Nick all the time. They were constantly in contact and. Um, David, I would say, spent more than half a day or two thirds of the day when we were all in the editing room on the phone. I mean, he was, you know, he was always trying to make things happen. And um, it may have been, I don't, I, I'm not sure that, that uh, in one of those conversations, uh, he, he brought that up with me. I don't know if it, if it came up before everybody went, but th they had to go to London. The Stones weren't gonna come to the States to make that happen, so that was, that was part of the issue, was that it had to happen there. Um, and I think it was also a way for them to feel 
more comfortable and more protected, you know, in, in looking at the footage in that, in that context. But they understood that they had to um, make the Stones experience in some way a frame of this, not just the performers, but the witnesses. I mean, it was, in some sense, it was, it was a kind of Rosetta Stone also of the whole direct cinema uh, idea, the whole principle of direct cinema was that, that it, the, the truth had to come out of the experience in the moment. And that was the moment you couldn't get until afterwards. And it, the, and it also the, humanized the genius the was was having the film on an editing machine, yeah. and, and and it's the film in a film. And yeah. as you just said, that really is the essence of direct cinema. Yeah, but it's important that Mick's reaction and Charlie's reaction to seeing what hap what happened um, was part of the film. Oh yeah, yeah. And that's the only way it would ever been, if them watching it. It's interesting as well, though, that given this whole uh, creation of this experience of having the Stones watch the footage, uh, this, the advantage and the limitation of direct cinema is that no one asks them the question that we as the audience want to ask, right? We want to ask Mick, how does this make you feel? What do you feel when you see this? And um, we sense it in terms of what we're seeing, but direct cinema doesn't really allow the filmmakers to pose that question. David would never have asked a question like yeah, that. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's my, I hate that question. How do you feel? And also, you know, they, they, they were still in a situation where there was, the trial hadn't taken place yet, so I think you know, they, they, the whole idea of, you know, who was culpable was still sort of hanging in the air. Was it right. not? Correct me if yeah. I'm wrong. No, I mean, this was before Maybe the there were multiple angels uh, who killed, multiple angels who killed Meredith Hunter. Yeah. By the way, uh, <laughs> when we brought the film back from San Francisco, the Hells Angels put out serious contracts on Albert and David and me and said, we're history, that <laughs> they were going to get us and they were going to get the film because they were quite concerned that maybe the Hells Angels, the feds would come down on the Hells Angels and, and lock them all up or chase them out of the country or whatever. Um, nothing ever happened, but for the first few weeks after Altamont, we were <laughs> very, very nervous and um, looking behind our, our shoulders every every minute of every day. David was punched by one of the Hells Angels yeah. when he thought he could make nice to him. Right. <laughs> and but I, I, I think that the, the, the message tonight, you guys saw a movie that's almost 50 years old and the incredible cinematography and the incredible editing job that put all of this together it holds together as if it were shot yesterday and uh, it, it's just, it's the essence of documentary filmmaking. I just would like to add to the story about um, the Hells Angels roaming the Hollywood Hills looking for people to kill. Um, Baird Bryant, who's the person that actually did that shot, um, and I were getting film out of the lab in Hollywood and taking it to uh, my house in Laurel Canyon. And we were going through the footage. And we were just scared shitless that Sonny Barger, because we had heard, you know, that he was roaming the hills looking for us. And, and we actually found out, many, you know, fairly recently that Haskell Wexler, the great DP, um, who was the first person uh, approached to shoot the Rolling Stones. Um, and then I just heard last night from D.A. Penny Baker that he was the second <laughs> and went out and spent a couple weeks and was like, he couldn't relate. And, and then, he, and then he, he hung out with them and he didn't want to do it. He, he went and hung yeah, out with the yeah. Stones for a couple of weeks. And, um, <laughs> but so Haskell says that they, paid Sonny Barger off, you know, they bought him off by buying, getting, supplying him with some sort of motorcycle. Is that in your book? 
No. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, did, we only heard about it fairly recently. I, I, I'll give you a little bit of an after story, too, on Altamont. Um, I, I mentioned how we happened to get involved and the event happened to occur. But if we had not been able to get a free concert in San Francisco going, and you guys don't know this, we were prepared to, and had some conversations with the Stones uh, about a tour of Russia <laughs> right after they finished the abbreviated tour in New York, Boston, and Washington and got their album and put to bed in Muscle Shoals. We were going to take them to Moscow and we were hoping that the Russian police would use water cannons to keep the kids in, in, in line in Moscow Square. And we were envisioning a, a, a kind of anti-Altamont, but it never happened. Joan, having been present at the concert and having been part of the crew that was filming it, do you, do you feel like this film adequately conveys the, the chaos that you felt personally while you were there? Yeah, uh, it, it, it's incredible the choices that were made in the editing. Um, it's such a, you know, dark portrayal of what was going on. Um, they really did go for, you know, the dark side. Um, I always have a very hard time sitting through this film. Uh, I mean, I marvel at the way it's been put together. It's really, really brilliant. Uh, and that really is Charlotte's work. Um, Absolutely. And, but, but it's not a pleasant experience, for me anyway, um, sitting through the film. And Judy, I wanted to ask you this, but I'm hoping that everyone chimes in on this. Uh, what, do you, what do you see as the significance of Gimme Shelter, given that we're coming up on almost 50 years since it was released? Well, I think it was really the first no whitewash, no holes barred exposure of what a, a rock concert that really went on, you know, and it was, the Stones were known as the bad boys and the Beatles were the like clean cut boys. And um, I think it just kind of faithfully shows what can go on when something's not 100% planned. And it captured the essence uh, to me, a hundred percent. I wasn't there, thank God. <laughs> but from David's stories. Now, it's it's the Judy. It's the epitome of documentary filmmaking. Uh, it it doesn't get any better than Give Me Shelter. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. There are a couple other films that they made that are awfully good. Why don't we take some questions from the audience? The question is what, what happened in the third act? Why wasn't there some denouement to the big event, uh, the killing of Meredith Hunter? And we all tried very, very hard to get the Stones to react. And for whatever reason, they didn't. And we couldn't. And that would have been the denouement that you're looking for. I personally think it's a different film, and um, this is, for whatever else it may be, um, uh, beautifully integrated and um, um, honest um, distillation of, in fact, what the filmmakers <coughs> wanted to create, and something else would have been another story. This was the story of how this happened and not what happened afterwards, in my opinion. And I do think that by going and showing the stones, watching the footage, that that tells you it's a beautiful way to end the film. You know? And you know, real life doesn't necessarily get all wrapped up with a third act and a bow. It's kind of messy. And, uh, you don't necessarily find that kind of structure um, in actuality. 
Also, just one little coda to that, the, the, that end sequence, a lot of which Ellen Gifford cut, is um, an incredible metaphor. It's a retreat. It's, a, it's an elegiac moment. Why would you not want that to be what you leave people with rather than news reporting? You know. Anyway, that's my opinion. Yes. Was the guy that went on trial the guy you actually see do the stabbing was the same person? Yes. Yes. And he was exonerated. Self-defense. And there's a great picture somewhere, the San Francisco Chronicle, of Baird Bryant, who was the most amazing, raggedy, hippie-looking guy. He shot uh, Shirley Clark's Cool World. He had a mane of long hair, and he always wore fringe and bells. And, and this, this picture of Baird looking like a wild-eyed, you know, he was in a Nehru ja uh, jacket, um, and the Hells Angel in a three-piece suit, you know. <laughs> Baird looked like the criminal. We have time for one more question. I mean, one of the things that Charlotte did was she really masterminded getting all the eight tracks from the concerts. And so the Verite footage is a kind of guide track in terms of the music. And what you're hearing, in fact, is this phenomenal concert track uh, or the tracks from Muscle, Muscle Shoals, you know, the, the, um, uh, when they were listening to their own recording work. I think when the film first came out, it, um what was down the Rugoff Theater, they put in a, a special sound system. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that it could be heard properly. And that always used to frustrate David no end when he'd see it someplace and it wasn't playing the way he I wanted. think they did that in London as well when they had. Thank you so much to all the panelists and thanks to everyone for coming. <laughs>